Assalamu alaikum Farid, Habibi, can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam, how are you doing? Allah, how are you doing? Allah, good to see you. Allah, how are you doing? So, inshallah, after thanking... I think I need to put some headphones on, I can barely hear you. Ah, I just wanted to thank Sheikh Adli and then introduce our dear brother Farid, who is joining us all the way from the other side of the world. May Allah bless him and reward him for the da'wah that he's doing. Uh, I think he's well known to all of you, so no uh, in-depth introduction needed. Marhaban Farid, faddalu. Um, all right. All right. Shall I? Shall I start? All right. All right. All right. So before you start, a couple. Um, I'd just like to thank Shifan, Shifari, and all the organizers from behind the scenes for giving me this opportunity. Recording in progress. Okay. To share my thoughts on this very important subject. Uh, at least to me, the topic of uh, Shiism, Shia ideology, and Shia sources. Um, I, I, I'm quite attached to this topic, uh, especially because of uh, where I'm from. However, even those of you that are not really interested in this topic, uh, I'm sure you will be benefiting from this talk due to uh, the connections between uh Sunni sources and Shi'i sources and the Sunni system and the Shi'i system of authentication. Inshallah, it will increase your appreciation for the uh, Sunni uh, system itself. Um, so, first of all, uh, before even getting uh, into the topic, I'd just like everyone to be aware that the main difference between Sunnis and Shi'as when it comes to the subject of uh, Aqa'id beliefs, it's where we get these aqa'id, where we get these beliefs. And it's based on our sources um, that we have different beliefs. And it's based on our sources, um, our, our historical perspective are also based on our sources. Our faq are based on our sources. Um, our mannerisms are also based on our sources. And that's why sources are so important. So there's this uh, huge connection between sources and uh, aqa'id and whatnot. So to give you guys an example, um, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, when it comes to uh, Shi'ism, one of the main uh, foundations is the belief in 12 imams. Uh, the imam is an infallible, uh, divinely appointed person. Uh, that role is to guide humanity. Um, and if you reject one of the imams, then you're ultimately, uh, unfortunately, uh, going to end up in hell forever. Now, the imams are, according to Shiazam, uh, Ali bin Abi Talib, and then his sons, Al Hassan and Hussein, and then nine from the children of Al Hussein. Um, so Zin al Abidin, and then Muhammad al Baqir, and then Jafar al Sadiq, and then Musa al Kavim. And then um, Ali al-Rida, and then Muhammad al-Jawad, then Ali al-Hadi, and then al-Hassan al-Askari, and then finally Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Askari, who has been uh, hidden away um, in occultation for a thousand two hundred years. So, you know, that's that's a belief. That's uh, what she is believing, and this belief is not something that you could ever arrive if you were someone that exclusively took from Sunni sources. Similarly, if you're um, a Shi'i, you would never believe that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Aisha and Muawiyah are good people. It's because you are bound by your own sources and due to that, you hold um, beliefs that conflict with theirs and you conflict with them and you have a negative perception of them. Again, your history, your whole perception of history is different. So um, carrying on, um, these differences influence everything about our Islam. So it's very important to uh, look into these sources and compare these sources to come to a realization, to come to an awareness as to why we follow these sources. Um, one more example, um, if you're going to look at the character of Uthman bin Affan from a Sunni perspective, from Sunni sources, you can have a pro 
uh, Uthman view, you'd have a positive opinion of Uthman. Uh, on the other hand, if you're coming from a Shi'i perspective, you're going to have a negative view of Uthman al Again, we're all bound to our sources. So, uh, firstly, I, I'd like to go into uh, the Shi'i works, uh, the main Shi'i works themselves, um, just to give you a brief background about these works. Uh, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the four usul. So, firstly, we have uh, usul kafi or excuse me, we have Al-Kafi in general. Um, the first two volumes are referred to as Usul kafi And these are basically the Aqidah, the Aqidah, uh, much of what you find in Shi'ism can be found, can be traced to Usul kafi as well as other works, but from the four works, from the main four works. And I, I believe that they're seen as the main four works because of their size. Um, and of course, due to them being uh, quite early compared to many other sources. Um, now, uh, apart from uh, Usul Kafi, you do have some other sources that speak about Aqidah, like Tawheed al-Saduq, and inshallah, I'll, I'll get to that later. But what's really special about Al-Kafi is it's a book that contains um, many narrations about uh, the Imams, who the Imams were, um, the evidence that these individuals were appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the evidence is that these imams were appointed by one another and so on and so forth. And what exactly is imama? What's the sign of imama? Um, ideas about the, the disappearance of the imam and whatnot, right? So the author of this book is Muhammad bin Yaqub bin Ishaq Abu Ja'far al-Kulayni. He passes away in the year 329. He's from uh, al Ray um, or Kulain, which is near al Ray, which is modern day Tahran in Iran. Okay. And he passes away uh, again in 329 in Baghdad. Um, again, 329. And uh, by the way, excuse me, guys, I mean, it's, it's a lot of information, but inshallah, uh, focus on the main ideas. Um, the, the dates and names aren't, aren't necessarily too important, but I want you guys to get the general idea of, of where I'm going with this, inshallah. Carrying on, um, his uncle is Alan al Kulaini, and pretty much uh, Muhammad bin Yaqub al Kulaini is is the most reliable uh, Sheikh al Islam of Tashayyu, uh, Sheikh al Muhaddithin, and whatnot. So what I've just mentioned to you isn't a summary of who al Kulaini was. Actually, it's everything we know about al Kulaini. We don't really know much else about al Kulaini. And that's one of the main issues with uh, Al-Kafi and Al-Kulaini and whatnot. Um, and that, that's something I'd like you guys to uh, consider. The amount of information that we have, for example, about Al-Bukhari. Um, you could write a volume about Al-Bukhari. I mean, there, there were volumes that were written about Al-Bukhari, the man himself. Right? We have a wealth of information about him and his life. Uh, this wealth of information is, is missing when it comes to Al Kulaini, who's again um, the most important uh, muhaddith, Shi'i muhaddith. Um, carrying on, uh, the narrations in his book aren't from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, a relatively small number are from him. The vast majority of the reports are from the descendants of the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, his great great grandsons like uh, Jafar Sadiq and Muhammad al Baqir. And uh, Shi'is usually uh, tend to um, compare it in this way. They say, Sunnis you take from the Sahaba, and we take from Ahl al-Bayt. That's how Shi'is try to portray it. In reality, it's not really like that. In reality, it's Sunnis take from the Sahaba, yes, but Shi'is take from the Sahaba of Ahl al-Bayt. So we're all, we're all dealing with our own Sahaba, in a sense. Um, and between Al-Kulayni, and uh, the imams, you'll find multiple peoples in the chain, multiple people in the chain, sometimes four, sometimes five, sometimes six people, and so on. And what we need to do, or what a student of Shi'as needs to do, is in the same way that we apply Rajali standards, Shi'is also apply these standards, and they examine these chains, and they study these reports, and they look into the reliability of these narrators in order to determine whether a specific narration is authentic or not. Um, the book has 16,000 narrations, 
which is you know a, a relatively large number, um, quite large. However, the Kulaini only has, excuse me, um, is my image still here? Am I gone? Or is, is everything all right? Oh, okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay, excuse me. Okay, so um, El Kulaini, uh, 16,000 narrations, he has 28 teachers in his book. Um, from those 28 teachers, 18 of them are anonymous. We have no idea who these people are. 30% um, of his book is from one person, Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi. Um, we don't really know much about Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi either. We know he's uh, the son of uh, Ibrahim bin Hashim al-Qummi, um, who is one of the main narrators that came from Kufa to Qum. That's pretty much it. Um, his biography can be summarized in like, or not, excuse me, not summarized, but his full biography is like two sentences or something like that. Very short. Um, and to give you an idea of how different Sahih al-Bukhari is, al-Bukhari relies on 300 teachers or around 300 teachers. I think the exact number is like 293 or something like that. Um, yeah, so there, there's there's a big difference when it comes to the effort put into by each of these two scholars. Um, al Kulaini, uh, unlike al Bukhari, uh, focuses on all sorts of hadith. He's not just focusing on authentic hadiths. Um, and uh, there have been efforts in, in recent times by al Bahbudi, for example, a Shia, modern Shi'i scholar, to categorize or, excuse me, to summarize al, al Kafi and to extract the authentic narrations into a Sahih al Kafi, which was later on referred to as Zubdat al Kafi. Um, carrying on, um, one thing that's really interesting about these two works is the amount of uh, support that al-Bukhari has in the form of al-Mustakharajat. Um, a Mustakharaj is basically a book, a complementary book, in which the author quotes the same narrations as the original source, but through a completely different chain or from the teacher of the author. Um, it's usually similar chains from what the author had. However, the author of the Mustakharaj skips the original author. So basically, Al-Bukhari's narrations, but without Al-Bukhari. That's the idea of a Mustakharaj. So basically, if we were to one day come to this realization that Al-Bukhari is you know, a liar or he's someone who's unreliable, or something like that, it wouldn't matter because all of his narrations are preserved through other paths. Um, and you have a few of these Mustakhrajat that are printed, like Mustakhraj Ibn Aim al Haddad, Mustakhraj Ibn Aim al Sabahani, Mustakhraj al Bujayri's book, uh, a section of it has been printed, and Mustakhraj al Malanji, I believe, or al Milanji, is still in manuscript form. So uh, those of you that are interested in uh, editing manuscripts, that's some that's a good project for someone to pick up. In any case, Al-Kafi doesn't have that. So if we were to one day wake up and come to the conclusion that Al-Kulaini is someone who's unreliable, well, there goes um, something like 30%, 40% of Shia hadiths, because Al-Kulaini is that important of a narrator. And again, it wouldn't affect um, Al Bukhari, excuse me, it wouldn't affect Ahl Sunnah if there was an issue with the reliability of Al Bukhari. Carrying on the second of the four books, I'm, I'm going to try to speed up a bit, a bit because there's there's a lot of information here that I just need to get through. Um, the second of the four books is Man uh, Lahdarhu al by uh, Saduq ibn Babawe, referred to as a Saduq. Um, he passes away in the year 381. He's the Sheikh of Al Qummiyin of his time. Um, his uh, book is quite different than Al Kafi because he doesn't provide uh, chains from him to the people that he's usually quoting. He'd usually mention a name, and then he has like a separate mashiacha in which he would list his paths to these authors. Um, in any case, Saduq is a very important author, um, and he has multiple classical works uh, like Ayun uh, Akbar Rada, which is a collection of narrations of Rada. Uh, Ikmal al-Din, which is a book that argues for the concept of ghaybah, 
and occultation and, and the idea of the Mahdi still existing and whatnot, because in his time, a hundred years after um, the disappearance of the Mahdi, um, there was a lot of doubt among the uh, Shia masses as to whether the Mahdi existed or not. So he uh, wrote this book to basically uh, cause people to uh, rest assured and that they're fine and the Mahdi is, he will come out. Of course, it's been um, quite a bit longer. Um, he has other works like Kitab al-Tawheed, which is a book that uh, seems to be quite influenced by Mu'tazili thought because um, a lot of it is a negation of the uh, classical positions that were held by um, the people of Qom. Uh, previously, before Ibn Babawi Saduq, the people of Qom were people that affirmed um, the attributes of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so that's that, that's classical Shiaism in Qom. In fact, they were referred to as a mujassima by later Shias, which is you know, quite interesting. Um, yeah, and he's got a, he's got a bunch of other works as well, like the Thawab al-Amal or Aqab al-Amal, books on the rewards for punishments and for deeds. Um, excuse me, rewards for de good deeds and and uh, punishments for actions and whatnot. Um, carrying on further. Um, Muhammad bin al-Hassan al-Tusi is the author of two of the other four books. He passes away in the year 460. Um, the first is Tahdib al-Ahkam, which is quite large. By the way, um, you can find these works over there, the far um, right corner of the screen. Um, but yeah, Tahdib al-Ahkam is 10 volumes. Um, Alhamdulillah, my copy is condensed into two large volumes. Um, I do need the shelf space. In any case, uh, it's a massive book of fiqh and contains a lot, uh, the vast majority, I, I dare say, of the uh, uh, fiqhi opinions of or that have been shared by the imams. And the other book that Al-Tumsi wrote is really important, okay, which is Al-Istubsar Fima Ukhtulifa Min Al-Akhbar. And basically, the idea of this book is to reconcile contradictions. Um, since there are a lot of contradictions in Shia hadith, um, Atusi felt the need to reconcile these contradictions. And reconciliation can be done by simply um, sometimes rejecting a report, sometimes combining the meanings, um, sometimes saying that this is general and this is uh, a specific matter. And of course, we have the concept of taqiyya. And uh, this is, uh, and the concept uh, can be found in many places in this book. And this is a topic that I'd like to uh, focus on somewhat in this talk. So what is the concept of taqiyya? According to Ahl-Sunnah, taqiyya is basically um, lying in a matter if your life depends on it, right? Someone puts a gun to your head, asks you from, if you're a Muslim, they're going to blow off your head if you say, um, yes, I'm a Muslim. It's permissible for you to lie. And Shiaism, unfortunately, um, this has been expanded massively to the extent that small minor fiqhi matters um, are explained away as taqiyya. So there are some larger matters and there are some smaller matters. So, for example, the imam is approached. He's asked, are you an imam? Are you someone who is appointed by Allah? He would say no. I'm not. This, of course, is from the imam. According to Shi'is, this is a form of taqiyya. However, sometimes the imam will be asked, um, is mut'a haram? And Ali ibn Abi Talib, in Kitab al-Istibsar, says mut'a, temporary marriage, is haram. Uh, the Shi'is, of course, they explain this away by saying that this is a form of taqiyya. And, which is quite strange, because uh, why would Ali ibn Abi Talib be making taqiyya? Um, especially in, in a fiqhi matter. Uh, will Ali be punished? Will Ali be killed uh, for holding a fiqhi position? Uh, especially especially if it's a fiqhi position that you find precedence for, even among Ahl sunnah So you have Ibn Abbas, for example, holding this position. And similarly, you find many uh, statements that are um, statements by the imams that are seen as taqiyya statements, but in reality, their positions that were held by Sunni scholars. So, for example, the wiping of the head in wudu. How are you supposed to wipe your head? Are you supposed to wipe your head like once, or is it supposed to be twice? 
And then you have some Shi'i scholars saying, oh, you know, we need to reconcile these. Some may be referring to this as taqiyya. This is an issue because Ahl sunnah you have this difference of opinion among Sunni scholars themselves. So carrying on, um, what exactly is going on here? Why does this concept exist? Why are we referring to, or excuse me, why are Shi'is referring to these conflicting hadiths as um, taqiyya hadiths? Well, what happened was you simply had a lot of authentic reports that are not supposed to be seen as authentic. That's simply it. And they're looking at everything. They're like, okay, all this stuff is authentic. The imam is saying haram. The imam is saying halal. Okay, how can this happen? Well, maybe this was taqiyya. Maybe the imam was trying to um, give you two positions depending on who's asking him. Maybe it's a Sunni who's asking him. The imam is lying to the Sunni. He's telling the truth to the Shi'i. These, it's, it's a lot of... Um, uh, mental gymnastics when it comes to this stuff. And it's very unfortunate uh, because now uh, one who holds this view, one who ascribes this view and attributes it to the imam is essentially um, claiming that the imam is lying about religion, which conflicts with the reason that the imam exists. And the imam, remember, is a divinely appointed guide. But now he's lying to you he's lying to the sunnis he's telling people i'm not an imam so that's a major issue right there um and again why is this happening it's because of too many authentic hadiths and i'll, I'll give you like a, an example of how something like this could happen um and and do bear with me it's it, it may be a, a silly example but you do find examples of people lying and this is, by the way, this is in Sunni and Shia hadith works. People lie about food. You have um, fruit vendors, vegetable vendors, butchers lying about food. If you eat this, you get this much thawab, you get this much ajr, you know, things of that nature, right? Um, you, uh, just a few few uh, weeks ago, I was reading uh, this interesting hadith, a uh, Shia hadith, that says that Umar bin Khattab and Ali bin Abi Talib had a discussion about what's the best type of meat. Umar ibn Khattab said the best type of meat is chicken. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib said, chicken? La wallah. Chicken, that's the pig of the birds. In reality, the best type of meat is pigeon. So whoever came up with this seems to have been, wallahu a'lam, uh, someone that sold pigeon or something like that. And you could imagine how these sorts of uh, dynamics in society led to these conflicting reports. So you'd have someone saying, this is um, this is halal, and someone else would say, this is haram. And then and then the first person would say, I heard the imam say it's halal. And the second person would say, la, I heard the imam say it's haram, and so on and so forth. And how do we solve these issues? Well, to a degree, if possible, we look into the books of Rijal. And um, like ahead of Sunnah, Shi'is have books of Rijal, uh, they may not be as impressive. However, they have works nonetheless. So the first of these works, and perhaps the most important of these works, is Iktab Al-Kashi, Ikhtiyar Ma'rifat Al-Rijal. And uh, Al-Kashi's, the original work is lost. We have a condensed version by Atusi, the same author of his, <laughs> his Tibsar. Um, in any case, this book is the best book for someone that wants to learn about early Shia society because it's filled with anecdotes, filled with all these examples of um, early Shias and how they react to the imams and how they reacted with one, with one another. And um, it, it's filled with really interesting stories. In any case, um, what you find really interesting in this book is it's not Al-Kashi who is criticizing narrators and weakening narrators. It's mainly the imams themselves. It's Ja'far al-Sadiq saying, this person is going to hell. This person is going to heaven. Um, and unfortunately, what we often have is the same imam condemning a narrator in one hadith and praising a narrator in another hadith. So in one hadith, he's saying this person is going to hell. 
In another hadith, he's saying this person is going to heaven. So this was simply explained by uh, Shia hadith scholars that came later on and, and scholar, Shia hadith scholars in general, that this also is a form of taqiyah. The imam was simply trying to throw people off because he didn't want people to know that this person is a close friend of mine. So I'm going to tell everyone that he is going to hell. So now this person is safe. He's not going to, he's not going to be imprisoned. He's not going to be attacked by the, the Khulafa of Bani Abbas or, or Bani Umayyah or whatnot. This person is safe, alhamdulillah, because I said that he's going to go to hell. So that, you have that sort of justification. Um, in my opinion, what seems to have happened is the same thing that happened with the earlier hadiths about the chicken, the pigeon and whatnot. It's you had people attributing to the imams that which they did not say. So what's likelier that the imam had two positions about a specific person or the imam had one position about a specific person? Maybe the imam simply said that this person is going to go to hell. And then other people attributed to the imam that he said that the same person is going to go to heaven. This seems to be the likelier scenario. And um, a good example for those that are familiar with Shia Rijal and the books, check out the biography of Zurara. Um, he's one of the biggest Shia narrators. You have a chunk of reports. They're just filled with praise. And you have another chunk of reports filled with condemnation. And if you actually study the narrators in the chains, you'll find a pattern. So like the children of Zurara are, are usually there when Zurara is being praised, right? So it seems like they're attributing to the, to the imam um, these narrations. Wallahu alam. In any case, um, that's the first of the uh, four or five books of uh, the useful uh, Shia books when it comes to Rijal. Um, the next one is uh, Rijal al-Najashi, which is, um, in my opinion, perhaps the most useful because it's clear-cut, direct. Uh, Al-Najashi passes away in the year 450. Oh, excuse me, Al-Keshi passes away, the previous book, Al-Keshi passes away, uh, he, around 300-something. He's, he's a contemporary for the In any case, in Najashi passes away in the year 450. Um, his book is direct. He simply says, this person's weak, this person's reliable. He presents his isnad to the books of that specific narrator. So this that, this specific book, uh, Rajal Najashi, is filled with information. Um, I mean, useful information, at least, compared to the other Rijali works I'm going to be uh, referring to soon. Um, the next one is Fahrist um, al which is very similar in its uh, um, order and organization to uh, Rijal al-Najashi. However, there aren't that many um, gradings of narrators, so he doesn't speak about their reliability or weakness as much. Um, the work after that is uh, Rijal al which is a very interesting work because it's it's somewhat larger than the rest in terms of narrators. It includes something like 6,500 narrators. However, um, most of those, uh, uh, most of the, the narrators in the book don't have any sort of description. Um, Atusi doesn't tell us if they're reliable or not. Um, it's just name after name after name after name after name. Once in a while, he will say, this person is reliable. This person is weak. The vast majority of the time, he, he doesn't mention any of that. Um, sometimes he includes details about their life once in a while. He'll include um, information about when they died or something. Um, and it seems like he's getting that information from earlier Sunni sources. Uh, because there's, uh, there's, some, there's some biographies that are pretty much identical with information that you find in Sunni works like Tabaqat ibn Sa'd, for example. Um, carrying on, uh, finally, uh, you have Rijal ibn al-Ghaba'ari, or Dhu'afa ibn al-Ghaba'ari, uh, which I have right here. Um, it's it's quite a thin book, and uh, ibn al-Ghaba'ari simply lists out the weak narrators. And for those that actually go through these works, you'll notice that ibn al-Ghaba'ari um, seems to be more of a muhaddith, more of a critic, um, a better judge, uh, very uh, critical and very um, specific in his criticisms. And in my opinion, and he, he surpasses the other 
uh, Rijali scholars better than Najashi, better than Qusi. And this is the position of um, the, the so-called Ayatollah Sistani. Uh, he prefers uh, Ibn Gawari's book over other works. Now, to give you guys an idea of uh, the differences when it comes to the wealth of, the wealth of information, remember, this book is um, 400s, right? Early 400s. And this is what we have from their works on du'afa, on weak narrators. To compare this to what Sunnis had at the time. Um, so what we have right here is du'afa ibn Adi. This is nine volumes, right? So that's a lot more information. So Ahl Sunnah, when studying weak narrators, they put in a lot more time, a lot more effort, um, and the biographical information uh, is a lot richer. And this is one of the reasons why I was saying um, I strongly believe that Shi'is did not do enough when it comes to pointing out the weakness of narrators. And it's due to this that Shi'is have too many authentic reports, a lot more authentic reports than they're supposed to have. Um, I just want to give you guys a couple more examples of the lack of uh, information when it comes to uh, the Shi'i system. The concept of marasil, the concept of disconnection in reports. Uh, as we all know, the, the main core um, things that we look at uh, when we're studying a hadith is one, um, the reliability of narrators, the trustworthiness, and two, the connection. Did each narrator hear from his teacher? And with Ahl al-Sunnah, we have works that were specifically uh, focusing on that. So like, for example, Ibn Abi Hatim has Kitab al-Marasil, um, al-Ala'i, uh, Abu Zur al-Iraqi, they authored works that specifically speak about this person did not hear from that person. Al-Hasan al-Basri did not hear from Abu Bakr. He, don't, he, he did not hear from Arab al-Khattab. His narrations from them are disconnected, right? Shi'is don't have that. They don't have works in this specific field. You barely find them speaking about um, this person not hearing from that person. So due to this, when you look at a Shi'i isnad, you, you automatically assume it's connected. And again, that's another reason why you had more authentication than necessary from a Shi'i perspective. Um, another issue is the issue of Tadlis. So, um, for example, uh, for those that are not familiar with Tadlis, Tadlis is basically hearing from your Sheikh that which, excuse me, excuse me, Tadlis is narrating from your Sheikh that which you did not hear. So, for example, if I said, uh, Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid said that pork is haram. Now, notice, I didn't say I heard Sheikh Karim say. I said, Sheikh Karim said. I'm not specifying that I heard him say this. Now, if I'm constantly doing this, and if I'm uh, getting this information from an unreliable source, actually, even if I'm getting this information from a reliable source, but basically I'm, I'm getting this information from a secondhand source, uh, I will be considered in a category referred to as a mudallis, someone who is making it seem like he's hearing from his sheikh, but in reality, he's not. Ahl al-Sunnah have lists of mudallisin. They have works that are written about the mudallisin. They've compiled compilations, categorized the mudallisin. This doesn't exist in Shi'ism. And again, due to this, you will look at the Shi'i chain based on Shi'i standards, assume it's authentic, when in reality it's not. So that's another um, way that the system itself has failed. Um, one final example in regards to this is the topic of al al hadith al hadith is the uh, perhaps the, the hardest um, form of uh, hadith criticism. al uh, hadith is to basically, you see, catching a liar is easy. Catching someone lying in hadith is relatively easy. Catching the mistake of someone that's reliable is a lot harder, right? And um, you have, alhamdulillah, you have classical works by Sunni scholars that focused 
on simply doing that. Dara Qutni has got like 14 volumes um, providing snad after snad after snad, pointing out where um, the narrators went wrong, where they went right, what's the correct way this snad is supposed to be mentioned. Very detailed stuff. So catching the mistakes of the reliable narrators is a field that Ahl Sunnah um, held exclusively. In Shiism, you don't have that. And that's why in Shiism, you don't take that into account. And again, due to this, Shiis authenticated a lot more narrations than they're supposed to. They relied on a lot more narrations than they're supposed to. So uh, in conclusion, um, I just want to summarize with this. Um, Sunnis and Shi'is take their beliefs from their own respective sources, and it's impossible if you're a Sunni to follow the Shi'i corpus, and it's impossible to, well, it's, excuse me, it's impossible to be a Sunni if you're following the Shi'i corpus. It's impossible to be a Shi'i if you're following the Sunni corpus. Um, there are many issues with the Shi'i authentication system, and due to those issues, there are many more hadiths that are authenticated that should not be seen as authentic. Um, the Sunni authentication system is more robust. It's filled with information about narrators. Um, you can write books about the narrators and their lives. Um, of course, not all of them, but I'm the major narrators. The more important the narrator is, the more information that we have about their lives, as opposed to um, what we find in Shi'i works. And she, uh, Sunni scholars take into consideration things like uh, tadlis, disconnection, and hidden defects. So therefore, if one had to make a choice between the Sunni corpus and the Sunni system versus the Shi'i corpus and the Shi'i system, in order to determine where you want to take your beliefs from and which of these two reflects Islam more authentically, then it's a no-brainer and the Sunni system and corpus outshines the Shi'i system and corpus in pretty much every angle. And that's pretty much it. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.